Robert, who opened the conference, will also close it with the last talk. Please, again, don't forget to rate all the talks, because after this, there's going to be the best uh, talk award. And um, why is it so crowded? Robert brought some guests. I think he found them in the forest. <laughs> And uh, please welcome on stage Robert Lemke with his two guests. Thank you. Hello. Welcome. And welcome on stage, Basti and Christopher. Yeah, this will be a special session. Um, I wanted to show you a bit um, of insights, how you can create a modern flow application uh, today. So you remember, uh, remember how it was like in the early days of flow and also um, in the flow core still that you have model view controller and fluid and, and so on. Um, but uh, this has changed a bit. I mean, it depends on your preferences, but there are new concepts. And uh, what I was missing when I had to create a little application was one example which showed me everything playing together. And uh, this is what I'm going to try to show you. Oh, that's a very nice uh, picture of me. But I have nicer pictures from you. <laughs> um, yeah, so the point is, <laughs> sorry for that. That was uh, Apple Photos looking for Bastian, looking for Christopher. And that's what, what uh, comes out. So why do I have Basti and Christopher here? Because uh, there will be some concepts which they have more experience than I do, uh, but, uh, and, and they will ask me some, some inconvenient questions along the way. Um, so I think it helps to understand the application. And since we don't have much time, I'll show you the application I'm going to present, um, and then we go into all the different uh, technologies which are used there, and I will try to uh, show you some live <laughs> coding stuff. And um, I think what makes most sense, we won't have time for, for questions in the end, maybe one or two questions. Um, if you have a question which fits directly into that uh, spot, then just shout, and I will repeat the question and then try to answer it right, right away so we make it a bit dynamic, OK? So this is the application. Um, it's called Flow Native Cabana, and you can buy it anywhere and not book it anywhere. <laughs> it's just an in-house tool. Um, so the question uh, we had was, uh, we are using a lot of different tools for uh, time uh, logging and for sending invoices and for payments and customer uh, management and so on. And we want to keep using these services, but uh, we were missing some central place which would control everything. So, for example, if there's a new contact or a new customer, um, I want to update lots of different services which we are using, uh, software as a service providers. Uh, and even our uh, phone system. <laughs> it would be nice if that could be updated if there's a new contact and then I, when I pick up the phone that I see the name, you know? And this is the role uh, Cabana is playing. It's just uh, that little application in the middle, uh, which is our central place for customer accounts and, and also invoicing and so on. Ah, yeah. <laughs> you have to know that I'm a PHP developer, mostly. Right, and um, of course, I, I was in touch with JavaScript all the time. We have that nice user interface in, in Neos and so on. But I could uh, mostly modify existing things and add a little here and there. But I didn't really know uh, React or so. And I started learning React and Relay and TypeScript and and all that in earnest last year. So this is I'm I'm a newbie, but. I'm very proud that I could create a user interface now, um, uh, which I'm going to show you. Right. So here we have the demo. Um, right. So we have customers. We have contacts. I can uh, search for something. Right. 
Uh, I can uh, look into customer details. I have a little navigation here. Um, and I can also, of course, modify these things, uh, um, modify the address and, and so on. Uh, I can look into subscriptions, uh, settlements, and, and all that. So this, this is basically the application. Um, yeah, and I, I now go through the uh, different techniques and uh, frameworks I'm using for that, and then we look into it uh, more properly. So, right, so I'm using GraphQL. Who has written a GraphQL based application already? Oh, it's familiar. Yeah, I see. Yeah. So, <laughs> you did? Right. Um, okay, so I'll explain just a bit of GraphQL. We won't be able to go into everything, but basically, it's a query language. Uh, which allows you, um, which allows you to uh, query uh, nested structures, and it has some optimization there. And then the server responds with what you want. For example, this here would be a typical query. I'm asking for a customer account, and uh, with a certain identifier. And what I want back are these properties. I want the ID, the customer name, customer number. Uh, what's nice about GraphQL is that uh, it makes additions to your API and, and uh, changes to your API very easy because you don't have to um, uh, version your API like REST services. Um, if this uh, query here, for example, would return more properties, that would be no problem. I, I mean, I can just ignore these with this old query or start using that in the future with uh, adding the field. So I ask for a customer account, and what I get back is JSON. So this would be the data, maybe. Um, so you see, I, I, it gets, it's, it's not actually <laughs> the re response to this. <laughs> it doesn't fit. There's a bit more, right? So uh, it also contains customer sins. Ah, the microphones. Yeah. It was not only for visual reasons that I invited you to the yeah. stage. Now we can get serious. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, normally you, you would just get the data that you requested. and That's true. Yeah. But this is what, what you get, more or less. Um, and as you also can see, there's customer account, and that's not the name of a class or something. That's the name of my query. So I can ask m multiple queries within one HTTP request. So that, that is also very efficient. Uh, now, you need to know, how do I define uh, in GraphQL that these queries are actually possible? And there's a schema, a GraphQL schema. And this would be the type, um, uh, the query type I would define for this kind of query I've just shown. So uh, there's a customer account query. Um, it requires, or it actually doesn't require, uh, you have to provide the ID or customer number, and uh, then at the right-hand side you see that there's also a type which is expected. So if I would provide uh, the customer number as an integer, I would get an exception by the GraphQL server. Um, so Sorry, can I interrupt? Yeah, of course. I was wondering, so what's the difference between the ID and the number? Why do you have two? Yeah. And why do they have such a weird format? <laughs> um, well, actually, the ID has a type, uh, which we'll see later, uh, which is required by a node interface. Um, and maybe I should uh, refactor this to two different queries, so get the customer by ID and customer by cu customer number, and then make the properties required. Right? So if you put an exclamation mark right after string, for example, uh, then this would be required. Okay? Um, this will return a customer account. And you see there's a type customer account. Um, this could be a possible customer account. So you also see that uh, you have something like interfaces. So it's basically like classes and interfaces, more or less. Um, or, yeah, 
types, <laughs> value objects more. Everything is a type in yeah, GraphQL. Everything is type. Um, right, so a customer account, and there you see the exclamation mark, right? Uh, so there will definitely be an ID coming back, definitely a customer number and a customer name, and possibly a business address, which is another complex type. So you see that you can combine these different types, right? And then if you uh, send a query um, for multiple customer accounts, it gets more interesting um, because um, GraphQL or Relay, which I'm going to show in a second, uh, supports pagination and not based on numbers like first page, second page, and so on, but um, you use a special cursor, uh, which is uh, defined in, in Relay. I'll show you that in a second. So in this case here, I'm running a query for customer accounts with a certain search term. And then below that, you see all the fields I want to get back. And the special thing here is now that I don't get an array of customers back or customer accounts back, but they are more hidden down below. You see I get meta information like the total count of search results, um, if there's a ne next page and so on. And then I get the results as edges and the actual cursor, the current cursor, and then the node is actually the customer account. But, but that's really more because Relay yeah. is doing it that way, and if you design your schema like that, then it ju just fits, because this is not how we do it. We use other clients for GraphQL, and then you yeah, don't yeah, have exactly. to, to have a node and edges, and yeah, it's some more indirection, but yeah. Yeah. get something for free. <laughs> Abs yeah, absolutely. Um, so this is not the most simplistic uh, example, but uh, the most simple example doesn't really tell what's, what's then possible, I think. Um, so this could be a possible result. Uh, w if I have a search term which only returns one um, customer account, then you see the property uh, total count is one, there's no previous page, there's no next page, and then you see there are the edges um, and the current cursor, and then the customer account as a node. And the cursor is not a number or identifier or something. That is something you must not care about. So it doesn't mean doesn't, don't have to care about, but must not care about. But I do. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine what that is? Can you decode that it in your head? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> space 64. You already saw that Space 64 mm. encoded, yeah, right? sure. <laughs> you can use anything that's implementation specific, what you like. It just uh, means that it identifies your search results. So if you ask for more customer accounts, you can say everything after this cursor. OK? Can you implement like the number of pages if you want because this is okay with forward, backward mm -hmm. pagination, but could you implement that on top in the page info, that, or is that? That, that you give the number of pages mm -hmm. you want to see? Yeah, you could uh, implement it as a cursor and just use a number for that, for maybe. And <laughs> but then it depends on the page size, yeah? So it's also the specification for this relay pagination. It specifies you have to include those fields, but there's no reason why you can't include something like total pages. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right. OK. Um, some, some other topics just uh, briefly, which I'm going to show. Um, so CQRS, um, you're familiar <laughs> with that. You heard lots of talks. But CQRS uh, doesn't always have to be used in combination with event sourcing. Uh, yes. For example, Christopher likes to use CQRS um, uh, to use that without event sourcing. It just means that um, it is optimized uh, for appending data. So you send a command and it appends data. And then you have an optimized way of a read representation. Is yeah, that it, correct? It, it especially <laughs> leads to not thinking in one model for everything, which yeah. is like what we saw in many applications, if you one, have one entity which has to deal with both write concerns and read concerns, it gets messy. So, and, and, we really, and it just fits perfectly to GraphQL mutations. It's a command 
you have a DTO, a handler, mm -hmm. just did it go through or you return errors with maybe validation errors more structured, but I think it works really well. And you can use any kind of querying, be it database tables or more elaborate thing. And yeah. And of course, you can use event sourcing underneath, but I think CQRS is the most important architectural design. Yeah. Also, it gives more information about what you try to do. So if you, for example, just delete a row from the table, um, then it's gone, of course. But with this, for example, you could uh, implement something like um, queue for deletion, and then it go, will go through some uh, process, and then eventually will uh, be removed. Eventually is also something, a word used very often in combination with event sourcing. sourcing. So that just means that you don't store your data directly in the tables, um, update everything directly, but um, you store that as a sequence of events. Um, and if you uh, go through all these events in the correct order, you will be able to calculate the current state of an entity. Correct? <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well done. <laughs> no, no, you did it wrong all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and something we use, we all use very often, and not only for certain cases, but in the meantime for basically everything where it's possible are value objects, because um, it dramatically narrows down the errors you can have because uh, the order of arguments are wrong somewhere or different type or so. Imagine you have a method uh, which accepts 10 arguments and all of them are string and then you mix up the order somewhere. You won't notice that ever until something breaks further down uh, the code and if you use uh, types really like uh, a customer identifier as a value object in, in the simple case, then it will al already be checked by PHP and, and won't go wrong. And of course, it has other uh, um, advantages. So, and I used React.js. I won't say much about that, except for uh, before I learned that, of course, I tried to learn something more modern, more fancy, and I, I did. But it was so fancy that I wanted to have something more conservative, uh, which React is because there you only need to refactor your whole code because something was deprecated every two weeks and not like every day. So you had some friction during the <laughs> development process. Aww. This is based on React 18. Uh, <laughs> which is brand I thought, yeah, it will be the next major version, so yeah, why not just already wait use a it? Bit. <laughs> uh, yeah, now I learned it. Uh, I use Yarn, as you know, it's a continuous length of interlocked fibers uh, suitable for use of the production of textiles, and uh, that became very handy. I also use Yarn. <laughs> Do you already use the new yarn or yarn one? Or? I use uh, yarn from this morning. <laughs> <laughs> That's deprecated. <laughs> Is there a later yarn? <laughs> I have no idea about yarn. Uh, I know, I, for example, I don't use, not, yeah. use workspaces and so on. Yeah. Uh, I, I just use it yeah. <laughs> to get things running. Um, okay. Um, and I uh, already mentioned that I use Relay, uh, which works nicely with React and helps you optimizing queries and doing some fancy updating uh, data fetching, uh, which I'll show you in practice. And yeah, for the user interface for styling, I use Tailwind, but I won't tell much about Tailwind. The most prominent PHP packages I use are Flow, uh, the Neos event sourcing, a uh, job queue, and uh, this GraphQL uh, PHP library, and uh, Flow Native GraphQL. That is nothing really fancy. It's just basically one or two classes, but I use that so often in uh, different places, so I put that there. There's just a bit of glue code you might want to create yourself or use that, whatever. Now we only have to explain all the things. Um, so let's, let's do that. Um, 
Sim yeah. Simple question on, on the general approach. Um, so, did you split it at the? Yeah, do you use a mono repo and have like yes. a separate back end and front end part, and these are really separated, or is it like the front end code is part of a package and it would interest me? Yeah, I, I use a mono repo, um, and well, I, as I'm not okay. that JavaScript guy, I just put all the JavaScript yeah. here into yeah, okay. uh, yeah, it's, it's, a flow it's package. certainly package. possible, but we split that at the top level, for example. And it's yeah, always, it's, uh, it scares me when Christopher says something. It's certainly possible. It's certainly <laughs> possible. <laughs> Certain people do that, but <laughs> it's your own choice. <laughs> no, it's uh, always trade-offs. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, the idea is that I walk you through uh, something which could happen in the application. For example, uh, what happens, what would you start with, uh, a query or a mutation? Cancelling a subscription. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no mean, <laughs> no, no mean questions. <laughs> no mean questions. Um, okay, let's, yeah, let's, let's use this one here. Um, I need to check very quickly if I actually... Ah, right. I need to start all the things, okay? So, demo gods. I have a tab here with uh, local beach, so this is what I use for uh, the flow application. Then I need to start a relay watcher. Relay watch. And... Oh, theoretically, the dev server should be running. It is. Yeah. Um, before the conference, I tried very hard, more than a day, to strip down these applications into little chunks so you can try that on your own. But I, <laughs> I was not getting anywhere because there's so. I mean, there's OpenID Connect in there and and some other services. Um, maybe I find the time to spend a long weekend or something uh, to strip it down into uh, yeah, code. I, I can share with you a uh, shorter code. Um, and if I don't, then just write me an email, so I do, right? Um, I, I definitely want to share things I used here, but uh, it doesn't really make sense to share the whole application because you won't be able to get it running so easily. It's an in-house tool, after all. Yeah, but maybe reducing it to some kind of boilerplate, that's what we use yeah. uh, internally. So you have the full repo set up with everything connected, but just basic, no, no, no complex types. It's just, okay, you have accounts, users, and some basic stuff, and can build on top of that. Yeah. Okay, so everything is running here. Now, what I need to do is um, run, uh, start the job queue, and I'll show you in a second why that is. That, uh, now, what was it called? Event sourcing. Ne yeah, event sourcing. No, How, what is it called? <laughs> Work. Ah, with dash. a dash, right. Okay, so theoretically, I, would, I should be able to uh, change something here, like create a contact person, Christopher Lubeck, Christopher Huch, at Neos.io. Uh, create that. And here's Christopher, and now I should be able to go to customer contacts, for example, and search for Christopher and edit here, okay. Now I can say Christopher is uh, an accountant. <laughs> 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 okay, so you see that there are some jobs uh, running here in the background, and now I guess we should go through uh, the whole stack, what happens when I mm, mutate something, I guess, yeah. So, for example, uh, create a contact, okay? Um, I told you that uh, GraphQL is HTTP-based, so basically what's p happening here is that there's a HTTP POST request coming in. Um, can we do something? Yeah, like, 
also let you get invoices. <laughs> do, do, do you have a schema first approach where you have the, the GraphQL schema defined or is it defined by the actual I, I always define the schema manually first. Okay, but you don't generate the code. No, the I don't schema. generate code. Yeah. Um, maybe I would if I would know how that can be done in a nice and reliant way, but on the other hand, I made so <laughs> bad Mm -hmm. Experiences with yeah, code yeah, generation I, I, that I don't. I actually have good experience, but not exactly with these packages. So yeah. Oh. Ah, okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, okay. So there's an HTTP request coming in, and how do you handle that? <laughs> um, you need some, some place in, in a Flow application, of course, which handles uh, incoming HTTP requests. Previously, you probably used just an action controller with actions and so on, but we don't uh, use that here. We have just a GraphQL endpoint, and that's always the same URL which you define in the, in the configuration. Um, and then we have the HTTP handler where do I have that, actually? Uh, I think in that special uh, package, that GraphQL package, uh, the middleware. Um, so this is uh, HTTP middleware in Flow. You probably know that concept. We have that uh, for a few versions now. And what's coming in is a server request and a request handler and it returns a response, OK? So there are just some checks here in the beginning, and uh, security context and, and all that. And then there's an interesting line, actually, which is uh, fetching the endpoint, endpoint class. So we have, in this application, we have uh, one class, which is called so-and-so endpoint, uh, which should handle the GraphQL uh, requests. And then we uh, get the schema for that endpoint. And then this is here from, from that uh, WebOnyx GraphQL PHP library, a uh, server config which we can create, set the schema, a field resolver, uh, debug flag, and so on, and then create a new server and let that server, um, where is it? Yeah. Ah, yeah, Send, uh, prepare the request, and then uh, let the server process the uh, PSR request, and then return everything. So this is just uh, that little piece of code which connects um, flows, HTTP management, and, and uh, request handling with uh, the GraphQL library we are using here. OK? So far? Yes. Oh. So the, the, the schema and um, resolvers, how are, are they actual? Because that's where the actual interesting things are happening, right, in the yeah. field resolver? Exactly. So let's take a look at uh, the schema, for example. I sh already showed some snippets. So this is how the schema looks like. So we have that customer account here. And for pagination, um, there's a special concept of types, which is a bit more complex, but that is uh, called a connection. A connection has this meta information about uh, what page are we currently at, how many results do we have, and so on. That's called a connection. You can also sort. Um, uh, results, and I use an enum for that. Do you also use scalars, or, or mostly because scalars are also interesting to, to like have, have date time yeah. handling and conversions for, for types that cannot be splitted anymore, so the mo most atomic types, basically. Yeah. I, I, I find that really interesting to, to use for certain things. I discovered them very late, <laughs> <laughs> so I used them for a few things, but not everywhere I could use them already. So, for example, maybe I would use them for an email address now. <laughs> yeah, it works oh. quite nice together with yeah. the value objects, because mm -hmm. if you map them to the value objects, and in your value object you enforce certain rules, yeah. you can reuse them. Yeah. 
So I, on the PHP side, I use value objects, of course, for that, but yeah. Note for refactoring. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we need to uh, accelerate a bit, I see. So uh, we've only seen the endpoint. Now let's look at the more interesting part. Uh, so you get an idea. So I have one class here, which is called API. It's, it's the Uber class. <laughs> it's the Uber class. You can split it up into different resolvers and so on, but um, currently that... So I'll show you an application which works. I don't show you everything perfect yet. Uh, remember, <laughs> it's an in-house tool. Um, I added something like uh, Hello World here, and you see, uh, if I put that into the GraphQL schema, um, then through the resolve logic I implemented um, in the field resolver, I would end up calling uh, that, that the uh, middleware would call this method here. So if I run a GraphQL query hello with arguments, it would actually call this method, and it can return an array, for example, with, uh, which contains the argument. And then uh, the browser would get the JSON response in return, okay? Now look, let's look at the actual customer account here, because that's an example I showed. So if I query, um, for a customer account, and I provide the ID, uh, then I use a finder to, to get that object from my projection. So in event sourcing, uh, remember you have uh, events which you create. Ah, I wanted to show a mutation. Yeah, we wanted to start with a mutation, we, basically. Yeah, <laughs> hopefully we don't only end with that. Um, yeah, create. Uh, customer account, for example. It's the same, <laughs> basically, more or less. Okay, so, but, but there you see you map the inputs to something more meaningful for you, and that could be done by scalars, basically. Yeah, so. that's true. So here, the new customer account identifier creates a random identifier, right? Line whatever is, one above. Yeah. Uh, and then you also create a random con customer number. Right, so a customer account identifier is not the same as the customer number. Mm. Yeah, so why? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, but why, why do you need both? I mean, why? maybe it's not even important, so. Why I need both? Um, I, I, I yeah, I, that's kind of specific to this application. I'd like to separate the concept of a customer number because it could happen that I create a customer account but don't have a customer number yet because I have a strategy which, for example, counts up by one, yeah? yeah. And so I, I already want to have that customer account and be able to identify it, but I don't have a number yet. Makes sense, so it's like an invoice number yeah. in addition to some unique identifier. Exactly. So remember, uh, we send a mutation request. Mutation has, uh, means change something in GraphQL. And we end up in this method here, and the arguments, um, oops, Kabana, just a second. Yeah, the arguments would look like that, for example, just the customer name, okay? This would be the mutation. Um, so, and we end up, in this method here. So what this method needs to do is process the arguments we provide and then return a customer account value object. Let's take a look into that. Um, so this is using uh, PHP 8.1 uh, promoted properties which is very helpful because um, previously what you would have to do in order to create this value object or implement that is writing a constructor which accepts all the arguments and then you need lots of getter methods in order to retrieve uh, the, these values. 
so you cannot modify them from outside. Of course, you want to have private properties in that value object, and you only want to be able to read them. Um, and that's why you needed getter methods. And you don't need that in PHP 8.1 anymore. You can have read-only public proper properties. And this is here in, in this line. This is how you usually declare such a public property. So it's nothing else like, uh, like public string. You know, this is what you could do previously. And now you do uh, read-only public. Yet, uh, compared to a doctrine entity, there's no connection to the database here. So yes, exactly. Yeah. So this is not something uh, you're used to uh, as a model, DT, uh, ORM model, or something like that. This is just a value object um, which is used, in this case, to respond with uh, the new customer account. Can I split hairs? Yes. It's not a value object. Because it has, uh, it, it has sub, yeah, it's true. Um, <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So, um, a customer name, for example, is, why is that? Oh, that's old. <laughs> Do I have something else like the payment method identifier? Yeah, that, that would be a value object. You have seen the identifiers I was using. That's also the, implementation detail, you can use any kind of identifier, of course, UUIDs, for example. But in this application, I chose to use prefixes and then alphanumeric identifiers, which are a bit shorter than UUIDs. And that was very helpful. If you see an ID lying around somewhere, you know by the prefix what, what it actually identifies. So anyway, so I, I have from array methods here. Um, I'll get to that. <laughs> and I have to array and a JSON serialize which uses that to array. So the problem is, and maybe there's a better solution, but I didn't find that yet, is um, GraphQL wants the data you provide, the data structure, sometimes a bit different than PHP uh, does it. Yeah. So, for example, there's not, nothing like an associative array uh, in GraphQL. There's, uh, no. You would have to have a list with key value yeah, as... That, that's basically a, a thing where you, you stumble over if you think, yeah, I can just return a map in an array or hash or whatever it is called. And no. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's an array. And there are some other uh, yeah, little things which, which you might need to... Uh, reformat. So what I do, for example, is I format all date-time objects into uh, ISO uh, 86, uh, yeah, 8601 uh, formats, strings, um, and internally in PHP I only use date-time objects. Uh, just a little trick. So since you refactored this to use public properties, mm -hmm. You don't even need the JSON serializable as long as all the properties are JSON serializable. Uh, yeah. But, but they aren't right now because you use the daytime immutable, for example. So yeah. what I usually do is I create a custom daytime scalar ah. because then you can enforce all the formatting in one place and then you don't have to do all the conversion. Very good. Like. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a very good idea. So. Why do I have so much code in here? Um, the idea is, um, I, in GraphQL, I need to be able to return not only the customer account, but when you look into the schema, I can also ask for substructures. Um, yeah. So you see, uh, the customer account can have a business address and can have contacts. So let's look at the business address. The business address, uh, OK, that's just um, address line and, and so on. Um, and the contacts is actually a paginated customer account contact connection, which can have edges of the type customer account contact edge, 
which actually have that mapping of this is the contact and this is the role of the contact. But what you see is you have a structure, a nested structure, and sometimes you want to return that full structure and sometimes not. And I needed a way to create that structure. Um, so in the simplest case, Uh, where was I? In the API PHP. In the simplest case, if you only have the structure with one level, you can just return an array or something which can be serialized into an array, right? But what if you have that nested structure? You need um, either create something which composes different um, entities and value objects to, um, and prepares them so they can be returned. And in my case, I implemented that into that customer account here. So when you have a nested structure as an array with a customer account and then business address and just a regular associative PHP array, you can call from array and what you get back is actually that structure of objects. So when you ask for the business address, it's actually a business address object which is also created from array. It, it, it looks a little bit like a hand-rolled property mapper. Or yeah. Is it <laughs> yeah. <That's laughs> no, true. which is okay because I think sometimes it's better to have it more explicit than going through a lot of yeah. magic and conventions, and which is really hard to debug if something because that's just plain code. It's yeah. Actually, um, I I see some traces here from my refactoring. So previously it, that was not PHP 8.1, of course. And I also, I, I learned a few things, so the, the classes are of different quality, but in practice, it was very helpful that I could just have a JSON or array structure and then say from array and get the whole object structure back. And I can, can also do the reverse and do um, conversions like, for example, a date time object and so on. But I, I, I have some experience with other approaches to, to doing uh, GraphQL APIs. And what, what I, I see, I, I think you could um, leave out some code if the, the value object handling is done on the API mapping level and you have a close relation between the types and your value objects, if that's fitting or have some adapter there, because then most of the plumbing wouldn't be needed if you, I, I, we will talk about that later. That's what uh, uh, kill the yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. thing. If, um, yeah, I already see that we won't be able to get through all that, but um, the finder, for example, in, in that whole event source uh, setup is something which can retrieve a customer account from the database, and there are some special things here. So, for example, when I get a customer account, um, I can actually um, provide a flag here if I should retry finding it or not, and then it will retry for a certain time. So imagine you just created a customer account in the user interface, and then uh, in that mutation uh, for GraphQL, you already can query that new customer account and get that back so that the user interface in React will update everything automatically. Um, but since this is asynchronous, um, I write an event into the event store, and then the job queue needs to kick in and update the projection. So it takes some time until that customer account actually appears in the database. So if you would just uh, create the customer account and then call the finder method, the customer account is not there yet, and so you, you wouldn't get any changes back. And for that case, um, Basti, uh, advised to, to uh, provide ways of waiting for a change. Um, this is not actually... Uh, um, yeah, this here is more interesting, for, for example, for updating. Uh, Robert, maybe minimum we can version. go or zoom out again where we are right now in the... We won't make it anywhere. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no. But I think this is, if you do something with GraphQL and, and the user interface, that was something that, which helped me very much because um, 
the user interface wants to work asynchronously and update things. You have event sourcing, which is um, asynchronous. But the GraphQL API needs to work synchronously. So you create something and or update something and want to get the updated data back again already. And then one of the tricks is here to have something like get with minimum version, because the data in the event store will have a certain version. And for example, if you update an address, you know the version you have seen before the update, and can say, please wait uh, until I get the next version, and then have that fixed. And there's also a method, for example, like wait until is gone. So you just wait with a request, uh, with a response until something is gone uh, from the projection. Yeah, I see I, I need to create a workshop for, for all this <laughs> and probably also, uh, yeah, uh, refine a few things with the latest insights to PHP 8.1 and so on. Um, but what, what you could do is, um, if you're interested in this type of application, um, if, if that would help you, then just uh, write me an email. Um, and then I can uh, provide something. Or actually, write me an email with what are you interested in. So I, I can choose which type uh, part I need to extract from the application and, and make available publicly. OK? Yeah, so short time, and I don't have the luxury like with a keynote too. <laughs> yeah, but it's super interesting, right? I think we should work on something like a boilerplate where you yeah. have a foundation. Every application is different, but I think it's super interesting to to have that <laughs> because the interesting thing is, it, it, yeah, I came up with the same solution but with a completely different stack. So it's yeah, there's some universal <laughs> approach. There. That's true. That's true. OK, yeah. So thank you for nagging me. Uh, and thank you for uh, staying for the last session today. And um, yeah, see you next time at the next sprint, the next meetup. Uh, thanks a lot for being here. Well, thank you. Great having you. Yeah. Well, uh, no time. No time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, actually, you brought your questions with you. Yeah, don't you? <laughs> Bring your <laughs> own <Too> questions. Many. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we don't have any questions in the app, but... I, well, I thought so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But uh, thank you for that talk. Uh, thank you for... Everything here for the keynote. We have a little present, of course, for you oh, yes, as well. Sure. Somewhere. <laughs> Somewhere. You may rate this talk in your conference app. <laughs> Thank you very much. And this one's for you. Thank you. Okay.